friends, Jumbo Rafikis, thanks for coming back for chapter 14, Take Notes. Now, I didn't skip chapter 13. This is what I did. Chapter 13 is uh, Make Wise Choices. And because of the content of it, which is actually rather personal and rather um, difficult, I've decided to share that one only in a very brief video, which I produced for you and should be on your Facebook scroll as well. Uh, but if you want the full story, I do need you to read it yourself on uh, Kindle, on free book edition, okay? Anywhere you can find it, it's out there. But uh, I decided that that one, for the sake of my friendships with people that go far beyond this experience, I'm going to keep that one in print, not on video. Okay, this is Take Notes, and uh, it was the chapter that really initiated this entire book, so I hope you're ready. Okay, here we go. You want to meet a blue man? Asked my mother one morning over breakfast. By then, I had met a myriad of people of myriad colors, including the spotted variety such as myself. Myriad. Doesn't that word sound intriguing? I love the way the word itself sort of confuses the picture in your mind's eye. Now, I believe a place like Nairobi becomes identified as a melting pot, not just because of the image of myriad peoples peppering a pot, but because of the melting, the melding that occurs between the groups. All of these races, cultures, and religions coexisted peacefully, lovingly. So yes, I wanted to meet a blue man. I felt as though I had met every other color of person, so why not blue? And I wondered if there was any hope for green or purple people. Blue man was the outgoing ethnographer for the Nairobi National Museum. He was being treated for a skin condition with colloidal silver. Hakuna Matata, it's not contagious, madam. One of its side effects can be turning blue. I thought he looked like a grape with legs. And even though mom had given me a heads up, I still totally lost it the moment I walked into his office. His office, as one might expect of a museum ethnographer, was crammed floor to ceiling with old books, new books, masks, carvings, beadwork, basket work, musical instruments, and drums myriad drums. Then, in the middle of it all, a blue character bobbing from one curio to the next, like a cartoon. I should be reminding you of a Smurf right about now. It was too much to comprehend, and I started giggling. He knew he looked really funny, so he gave it his all. It was worse than that scene from Mary Poppins where everyone is laughing so much they're floating up to the ceiling. <laughs> Somehow, through the howls and giggles, we heard Blue say that the new incoming ethnographer would be returning from safari in Uganda very soon. He advised Mom to come and see her for advice on how to go about researching art in East Africa. I remember thinking to myself that the new ethnographer would have a very tough act to follow. The learning curve arched its back the moment we loaded ourselves into the Land Rover and tried to leave Nairobi for the first time. And thereafter, every darn safari we took. So here you go. These are Sarah's safari notes. I'd like you to please apply all camping knowledge and multiply times seven. Then you will also, number one, experience a vehicle breakdown before leaving city limits. Number two, need numerous pillows to pad the petrol and water tanks in the back where you get to sit. Uh, number three, too embarrassing to share. Read the book. Number four, plan ahead your route from the ground to the rooftop of the rover. Number five, get used to being in the fish, the fish in the bowl. Master your way. Number six, assume all crocodiles are hungry and all hippos are cranky. Number seven, 
under no circumstances whatever leave your windows uncovered when sleeping out on safari. Number eight, prepare for daily constitutionals in advance by having TP hidden in your pocket. Number nine, never, never appear to be more important than anyone else by making a huge hole for your leavings. Just go. Number 10, get over it. You are the television show. Reality TV's got nothing on you. Now, I would just like to point out that that is a very practical series of, of 10 pieces of advice you could apply to any aspect of life, really, not just an East African safari. Quaheri. Before we go on with this middle part of the chapter, I would like to remind everybody that my story, even though it still feels very fresh, takes place 50 years ago. I imagine things have changed quite a bit in the safari world of East Africa, and I'm hoping that these stories I share with you encourage you to go, not dissuade you. All right, here we are. This was the hardest lesson. The first lesson, yep, the hardest one in those days, was um, <clears throat> how to take care of one's daily constitutional in the bush. Before we had retired on the first safari night, Dad had marched out from the camp and dug a nice big hole with his trusty army shovel. He put a tarp up to block the view from the camp, and he put a nice roll of toilet paper on the handle of the shovel, which he stuck in the dirt next to the hole. If Dad were to read this now, he'd say, seriously, I did all that? What a waste of time. He came marching back to the campsite like Ernest Hemingway and declared, cover the hole and dig a new one when it's full. We newbies really appreciate his effort, efforts at three walls and a hole. That first day, while I thought everyone was preoccupied with trading, I headed over to the loo. I had waited a long time. Too long. Within 20 feet of, the, of exiting the site, I had 20 companions, men, women, and children. I made a lot of futile gestures, trying to run everyone off, but to no avail. I think that dance actually caused more people to get curious. I had to give it up. I got there saw all the company and decided all I really needed to do was to blow my nose. I did that with some tissue and threw it into the loo, causing everyone to fall down in gales of laughter. I took a fruitless bow and exited the stage. Dragged. After several attempts to just leave and go somewhere else, anywhere else to crap, I still had not been able to do so for all of the company it attracted. I waited the entire day until the trading had stopped at about 4.40 p.m. I realized that my opportunity to go while the light was still with us was waning. I didn't fancy going out there with the animals, so I just finally headed out. There were no visitors at the camp, but the moment I stepped away, I had about a half a dozen curious little kids following me. I ignored them. I acted as if they were invisible, squatted down, and finally relieved myself. I could have cared less. I finished, stood, and used dirt and brush to cover my business. The children cheered for me all the way back to the campsite. I think they were relieved to see for sure that I didn't do anything that much differently from the way they did it. I mean, you know in the end. Okay, to summarize a little bit of that chapter, what happened was that wonderful blue man introduced us to the incoming uh, museum ethnographer. Her name was Jean Brown. She and my mother took one look at each other and had a lifetime friendship until, oh, well, absolutely forever, until they both passed away, happy explorers together. Uh, but 
Remember that this was brand new for us and a world of experience for Jean that she was very used to. So to travel with someone like Jean was to jump in plugging your nose and just hang on. So here you go with the rest of the chapter. Our big soft American bodies were safari weary by the end of the first day we traveled together. We were not prepared for the discomfort of the ride. Pitching our tent and starting our first safari of what we hoped to be many was thrilling enough as it was, uneventful, fine. Everyone should get a good night's rest. We made our way to our shared tents and we slept soundly. We awoke, still in the dark, but just at dawn, to a woman's surprised scream, followed by my mother's voice saying, I'm okay, we're okay, it's okay. She was doing really well considering she just had the singular experience of rolling over in her comfortable VW combi camper bed and looking right into the face of a man wearing a colobus monkey tail headdress. The man appeared to be just ahead. He was smiling. His whole face filled the window. He was so close to it. He looked and moved like the star of a beach blanket Babylon production, and he was kind of teetery in the headdress. No matter how mom waved her hands about, he didn't understand that she wanted him to turn away so that she might get dressed. Once she realized there was not much chance of that, she started kicking dad to wake up. Dad, plenty awake to help but having way more fun his way, had pulled the covers over his head and was laughing hysterically. I wonder what Mr. Colobus thought about the wiggly mask behind the funny lady in the bed. Dad grudgingly sat up and turned his back against the window so Mom could get dressed. He kept teasing her, threatening to move over a bit. Eventually, all of us got used to the extra attention Mom sometimes received. She was a gorgeous redhead, a bit of a showpiece. She was super pretty by any culture, and she had to get used to people being curious about her hair. But this was the first safari. Mom was the first hermit out. She headed for Jean's tent. It actually had a bell on it, and Jean sprang up to stop Mom from coming in. No, she hissed, not until I'm ready. Mom explained the visitor, and still Jean denied her entrance. But she did offer a helpful Swahili phrase, something along the lines of, hello, the museum lady will be out shortly. Mom bravely approached Mr. Colobus, that's the day I learned my mom was a badass, and said, Jumbo! That caused his eyebrows to go up, his smile to grow, and his tail had to start bobbing, saying yes. He started speaking in Swahili, so Mom's sympathetic red head started bobbing up and down, which made her appear as if she understood him. She then tackled the part about Jean joining us pretty soon, and the conversation just fell apart. He looked at her quizzically, and she then repeated the phrase. As it dawned on Mr. Colobus that they would probably not be speaking in Swahili anytime soon, he leaned in very closely to look at Mom. She leaned back, instinctively nervous, and in a shaky voice, repeated the phrase again with a question mark at the end. Mr. Colobus looked at her, sighed, and said, What? Mom repeated her phrase. She didn't hear us giggling and laughing because we had caught on spying from our tents. Mom hadn't. Mr. Colobus smiled better than Sidney Poitier and said in a gorgeous, uh, like British African accent, do you speak English? Mom caught on then and burst out abruptly with a belly laugh. We heard the sound of gentle laughter all around us, but we couldn't pin down from where it came. The sun now began to cast daylight around our camp. What had looked like little fireflies here and there turned out to be the eyes of about 200 people who had come to trade. Ah, the laughers. It was kind of spooky, and at that point, a very eerie setting. The smoke from last night's fires was still burning, settling like a fog into the mini valley we camped in. It mingled with the morning's mist, which swirled around us. 
The flat spot where we pitched the tents was flanked by a row of little hills. This is where the people stood, a better vantage point for the television show they were about to watch. We had accidentally set up camp in their meeting place. When the sun fully rose, we looked around us and realized we'd set up our tents at the base of a series of terraced hills, nature's arena. We were pretty big news that day. People came from miles around to trade. Mr. Colobus allowed Jean to purchase the headdress. It had been his grandfather's. I imagine it's still there on display in the Nairobi National Museum 50 years later. We got used to being a curiosity wherever we went, but the learning curve was chew still chewed up a little more each trip. I took a nap one day in some shade at the campsite when no one else was around. I woke up sometime later to five children sitting in front of me watching me sleep. Dad tried to stay at the campsite once and made stew for everyone. He told us later that no one was anywhere near him when he started puttering around the stove. After a minute, after he'd begun, he had a group of about 10 very young, incredibly beautiful and mostly naked women. They were decked in colorful beadwork and little else. One girl had the body of Marilyn Monroe and she wore only jewelry. Dad almost fainted when she walked right up to the cooking pot and took a deep sniff. Later, at his nightly storytelling, he bragged, Ah, boys, she had the sweetest breasts I've ever seen. She said my stew smelled delicious. It was a good story, but I'm not sure I believe that last part. Nick, begged my mother, stop. By then, he lost the lady's favor when he started hamming it up, as he was always prone to do. He began dropping things and throwing things and smelling things. Their sweet behind-the-hand giggles turned to loud laughter, and Dad had to quit the role or sacrifice all his mojo forever. It was no longer fun. We learned. He learned. We learned. So a final lesson I feel I should impart is truly for your sake. Where not to swim, even today, 50 years later, okay? Uh, sometimes. It wasn't that obvious. One day, we set our tents next to a section of Lake Baringo that, unbeknownst to us, had floating islands. Their surfaces were solid enough to support wildlife. There had to have been an entire world lurking beneath the dark waters there. We woke up to an island that had moored itself at the shore. My brother, Chris, Already swelteringly hot by 9 a.m., felt the cool waters of Lake Baringo calling to him. Against the better advice of every other experienced traveler, he dove in. I watched him from the rocks above as he splashed about and swam. He washed his lead guitarist long blonde hair. I saw movements in the water behind Chris and called out to anyone listening, Are there crocodiles in Africa? No one heard me but Chris, fortunately, who answered, Yeah, alligators in the States. Here we've got crocs. I pointed to the crocs and I called out, We have crocs! A little louder. I followed quickly with, Do they eat people? Sure, they'll eat anything that tastes good, hollered Chris. Then I screamed, You should get out of the lake now! Chris turned, to look behind him and saw a crocodile's snout sticking out of the water, coming right at him. I've never seen anyone swim as fast as my bro did. He looked like a water-skimming lizard that kept on going even after he got to shore. I think I saw his feet rise above the water. <laughs>